so let's begin. My name is Ekaterina, I'm co-founder of Future London Academy and on today's series we are continuing conversations about how to grow a creative agency a design studio and we have a wonderful guest today. We have Natalie Graham, the co-founder of Uncommon Studio. If you haven't heard of Uncommon, they are incredible creative agency design studio that started in 2017 and already grew to 200 people and locations in New York, Stockholm and London. And they worked with clients like um, British Airways, WWF, ITV, Formula E, EA Sports and many, many others. So I'm so looking forward to this conversation to dive into all the aspects of how did Uncommon grow so fast to get to the size they are? How did they expand internationally? And how did Natalie actually led um, the team throughout this journey to get it to the success that it is right now? Welcome, Natalie. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you so much. Really lovely to see so many faces and, and people joining this, this conversation. So can't wait to get stuck in. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for being here. And as always, we start with rapid fire questions. Nothing serious, only silly questions. But uh, hopefully uh, we will learn a little bit more about you and then we'll continue with our deeper conversation. And then at the end, we will start taking questions from the audience. So are you ready for our rapid fire question? <laughs> as ready as I'm ever going to be, go for it. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, describe yourself in three words. Um, family, person, uh, ambitious, uh, disorganized. I think this is a, a wonderful, creative combination of three words. I love it. Where do you find your inspiration? The arts generally. I've always been a real fan of, of the arts and uh, growing up I was involved in a lot of creative arts. I'm sure many people on the call will have been, um, you know, it touched me uh, as a young person growing up and I didn't realise there was a way to actually have a creative career. Hence I fell into the the advertising industry and uh, and still still seek uh, inspiration from whether it's film or art or um, the performing arts. Branding or advertising? Branding. A uh, book that changed your mind on something? Grief is a Thing with Feathers is uh, a great book that uh, that we've been sharing here. It's, it's not particularly joyful, um, but it definitely gave me a different perspective about the other side of, of grief and death, not to bring the tone down. But yes, that's a recent one. What time do you usually start your work day? I'm not sure it ever stops, if I'm really honest. But it officially starts, uh, I think I start getting onto the emails around 7, 7.30. What time do you finish your work day? Again, probably the last email is probably 11 o'clock when I'm out with, uh, my, with my rabbits, which I'm sure will come up at some point, but I have two rabbits at home. I do quite a lot of emails uh, looking after them. I already created a very adorable picture in my head of you and rabbits. Oh my gosh, this is the cutest. <laughs> I think emails never sounded cuter. Let, let's put it that way. Uh, what's uh, your guilty pleasure? Chocolates. I actually have some emergency chocolates that right next to me right now, just in case I get a bit peckish. So, yeah. I, no one can ever say no to chocolate, isn't it? Professional achievement you're the most proud of? Starting Uncommon. I, th I think alongside that, and, and we may touch on it, but we created a campaign for ITV called Britain Get Talking, and it's currently known as, as one of the, uh, well, the biggest mental health um, initiative in the UK. Um, it started in excess of 100 million conversations around mental health. And I think, yeah, to work with ITV, to partner with them on, on that, but also to be there at the inception to help them form that, um, I'm really, really proud of. I'm really proud of the studio and the fact we were able to do that. So, yeah. That was a beautiful campaign. So I'm glad you mentioned it. This is, this is brilliant. Last question. What is the best part of working with startups? Honestly, because it's always easier to fix someone else's problem than your own. You do often, in talking to startups, I often find that I, I recognize quite what the power is we have, how brilliant creative, creative thinking can really solve business problems and being able to to really recognize the huge impact it can have you know if you have a, a small founding team some of the uh, brands we work with in our in our accelerator unrest um you know they may be only be one or two people maybe a team of five at, at most they can be really mighty at that point and i think that gets really really exciting um and really shows the value of, of what we can bring to any business whatever size thank you so much for answering round of very rapid very fiery questions we are done with this part now we can 
dive into the slower pace and actually answer lots of interesting questions about running a business and 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 growing a creative studio like yours. So I'm looking forward to to this conversation. So everyone can sit down, relax, grab yourself a tea, a coffee, you can or a rabbit, whatever will fill you. Um, make you feel comfortable. So please join us for the next hour and a half uh, talking about how to grow and scale a wonderful creative studio like Uncommon. So Natalie, uh, from what I know about your life story, which is very incredible, and I have to say you have uh, you had such a full career before starting Uncommon. And I, I wouldn't say this is actually a norm in the industry anymore that people start agency after having an incredibly successful career, you worked with some of the, in some of the best agencies. I'm, I'm jealous looking at your CV, like uh, you worked um, at Gray, you were managing director of Gray, you worked in a variety of companies and agencies that were producing the award-winning war work. And so you had this wonderful career and then you decided that you wanted to start something of your own. Uh, like you found people that you wanted to start it with uh, and together you started Uncommon. So I would love to hear about the first year or few years uh, of when you were establishing yourself and kind of these formative years of Uncommon. Did you always know what it will be um, and kind of the you had a clarity of the vision now that you know what it is? <laughs> was, it, was it that at the beginning? And what did you think you were building at that point? Look, I think it's always easy in hindsight. So I have to check myself a bit because I'm obviously incredibly proud of, of what we've built, but also we're not even halfway done yet. So much more that I want to do. I, th I think um, back to your your setup there, I, I'd, I'd worked for founders a lot all the way through my career. I was lucky enough at, at Fallon originally in the UK, um, at Mother, many different places working for people who owned their own company. And I knew that that was an aspiration that I personally had at some point. And I looked at it a number of different times, but it wasn't until Nils, Lucy and I were running Grey uh, that we met. And and I think there was a real shared appetite individually and collectively to try and start something. Um, but there was always that question of what are, what are we starting it for? And I think we each had our own frustrations with the industry. And so if you ask me now in, in hindsight, did I have a clear vision for it? I think we have a very clear reason that we get out of bed every day. And we're super clear about that to our talent and to our to our clients and prospective clients. But ultimately we we coalesced around frustrations in the industry that we were keen to fix uh, or to have a point of view on um, that couldn't be resolved by working in the, the industry as we saw it at that point. And so we needed to create our own. Um, so for any founders on the call, anyone who's thinking about starting your own thing, I, I do think it's, it's a case of if you want to build the industry you want to be in, then you, you sometimes have to leap off that cliff and, and do it yourself. And for us, I guess there were a number of different frustrations, but the main one being that we we didn't feel that we were really accessing and being able to show the power of creativity in all its guises and that showed up in a number of different forms we did a an incredible campaign um for <clears throat> for volvo sorry um called life paint and at that point it was essentially a spray i don't know if anyone would remember it but it, it's uh, it was a spray that when you sprayed it, a bag or anything it um reflected in a car's headlight um and it was um an act instead of an ad to tell you that volvo cared about road safety um, but what was frustrating for us is that that could have been monetized in a very different way. We could have made it into a product that could have gone far broader um, than for one one client. Uh, and we really did want to um, see not just the power of um, monetizing that creativity, but also it didn't take that many people to make it happen. Um, it just took a very long time because we were trying to um, create a business model that didn't really exist. We were trying to push against something that, that wasn't how the industry was really set up. So I guess in starting Uncommon, we wanted to work with people who are ambitious like us to, to start brands that people are glad exist, things like that that can really make a dent in culture as well as potentially start them ourselves. Hence our slightly different model, um, which is a more of a studio model um, rather than a pure advertising agency model. So yeah, 
a number uh, lots of things wrapped up in that I'm sure but uh yeah <laughs> I love this and and now that you mentioned the model let's talk about this because I feel like what you've created is something unique and I don't know if you saw it somewhere else working and that's why you decided to do it or was it like because it, it's very unusual um because you have your own startups you invest in startups you have revenue share in certain startups so tell us more how does the model work for your company and and how did it come about to make it this way our positioning is around working with clients in a moment of change because we do recognize our place in the world and um, we won't be for everyone talent or client but ultimately we really do want to make an impact with the work that we're doing and that doesn't have to be saving the world but it doesn't definitely has to recognize um the the potential for having that conversation in the world and uh, the platform that a that a brand has and therefore the the responsibility they have for for doing that and i think by return as as the people with the creativity that we're bringing to it we can choose who we make famous and so we've always held that very dear as to who are we going to apply our talents to and how do we want that to work and so with that often you find yourself in conversations with people who are at the start of that journey who are trying to make that impact but obviously are trying to challenge maybe established uh, industries and established, established verticals and those those conversations I'll be honest have shown up in many different guises sometimes it's an entrepreneur that we've come across who uh, like with um, sex brand which is a, a new consumer brand that's trying to change the way that people feel about um, sexual wealth uh, sexual health and um, and wellness and so we've been working with them at a very early stage to help them launch into the world to project that bigger shadow before they would have been able to walk into the pools of an advertising agency we've been working with them on their design uh, we've worked on their on their reason for being um, and really helped them to to get out there into the world far quicker than they would have been able to otherwise. Um, so that's one way that we've done it before. Um, but we also partner with Accelerator Program that we helped start called Unrest. Um, now, Unrest has had 47 companies through the Accelerator Program, all of them impact-led startups, so all consumer-facing brands um, that are trying to work against at least one of the UN SDGs, which is very exciting. And and these are really people who are, you know, jumping off the cliff like I did uh, in starting Uncommon to really start those consumer brands um, and to try and change those those industries. So we work with them on this 16-week program and really help them um, to establish brand, in, bake it into the walls of the companies that they're founding whether that's you know how brand shows up in an HR document as much as it does in the design they show up in the world. Because I think everyone on this call, I'm sure, uh, will be very familiar with the fact that brand doesn't just result in nicer advertising. It can result in, in just you feeling um, the company in a different way and how that brand is experienced um, when it shows up in the world. So how does it work from the business perspective? You still charge, I suppose, for kind of agency fee for a project and then you have revenue share in some of the startups do you have any like what, what does it look like for a startup or anyone who works with you all of the above <laughs> so it, it really does depend um at what stage we're having a conversation but yes we have equity deals we have rev share deals we have pure play time material type deals with fees so we look at it in lots of different ways um, and I think that freedom to be able to have that conversation and recognize that equity is always an emotional conversation for any founder. And, and so it should be because it is if someone's passionate about it, then then they should defend that with their life. Um, but I think if you are able to build a partnership that is trusted and recognizes the power that creativity can bring to the startup at that early stage, um, then A, they're the types of founders that we're likely to work with more. And B, we're hopefully going to make a, a difference at all parts of their journey. So the quicker we can come on board, the better. Love this. And and it's such a brilliant mission that you have helping the companies already trying to change the world, actually boosting what they're trying to do and making their communication clear and making their brand stronger so they can actually deliver on their mission. So I think this is just uh, such a great way to do what you love but help the world to be a better place so um yeah. this is brilliant so you started growing and you grew very fast I, I have to say I think in the you got to the 30 people in about a few years is that correct yeah I think by the end of end of the year year two maybe 
Yes, end of year two. Yeah. And uh, what was that growth like? Was it easy, kind of very organic, kind of you started getting clients and you had to hire more people? Was it strategic you were planning to get to like certain revenue or a certain amount of people or something to the, in, like within two years? What were these first two years like? It's always easy in hindsight, as I, as I said. It's, um, no, it was tough at points. It was, it was tough. And I think anyone who says otherwise is probably lying. It is very tough because I'd never started a company before. So you're learning a lot. But I think the biggest lesson I learned at that point was, as any leader, I'm sure, but you, you can't know it all. And particularly when you're doing something you've never done before, um, I'd, I'd managed a company before, I'd led a company that was already established, but I'd, I'd never started it from scratch. Had to put my ego to one side and I'd, I, and it's never come back um, to, to really recognize that I just don't know the answers, but there are lots of people out there that have done it before. Um, and there are lots of people who've done it in different industries, lots of industry experts. And I just asked for, I asked lots and lots of questions and I continue to ask lots and lots of questions. Um, of people who are smarter or just have different perspectives. Um, and I think, yeah, hopefully that's what this sort of conversation is designed to do, it's what to unlock a lot of that. But I don't think you can ever know exactly what the plan is. It was tough at points. We didn't start with any clients. We started with the three of us, borrowed desks and a dog, and that was it. So where, where did you go? Where did you find your first clients? How did you go from zero to, to something? I think I think the biggest learning and I guess key to our success um, so far is recognizing that everything we do markets to talent. So right from the start, we start we wrote the three of us, Nils, Lucy, and I, and like my two co-founders, we wrote something called the Young Contract. I think it was a promise to ourselves, if nothing else, and it was just the three of us at that point, as to how we wanted to show up and how we wanted to uh, the sort of company that we would be proud to work at. Um, and some of the frustrations that we wanted to answer. That was great for us, but it also meant it was a commitment between the three of us that in six months' time, we wouldn't have got it wrong and and created a, a company that we weren't proud of. But I think what it also did is it allowed us to to really be clear about how we wanted to market ourselves. And so we were, when, when we took ourselves out into the world and we did a bit of PR, um, it was in service of trying to attract a disproportionate share of the best talent. And in doing so, hopefully the best clients um, and being clear in our purpose and, and why we wanted to, to start on Common. We we did write a, a couple of different articles. We were lucky enough to get a bit of PR and literally our first client was from that. Someone got in touch, um, a wonderful man called Adam, who essentially said, look, I read this piece. If you're true as to what you're saying in here about what you want to do, then then I think we should try a project together. And and then it just went from there. And that became the the OVO ad that, that got us started. It's fair to say that lots of amazing people in the industry had said, oh, when you do your own thing, we'll, we'll give us a call. And we called them all and they were amazing at um, helping us hone our creds and hope, hone our story and be clear on what sort of company they would respond to. But they were unable, for many different reasons, um, to give us any projects at that time. And that was a very, well, it was a bit of an eye-opening moment. Um, I think it was um, a little bit of a worrying time of that first few months, thinking, goodness, we've, we've met, we were meeting probably three, four people a day, and yet nothing was coming. And it only takes that one project. And since then, I have a, a, a mantra where I, I just don't say no to any conversation um, unless it's against our, our principles of, of the sorts of clients we don't want to work with. We're pretty clear on that too. Um, we will meet lots and lots of people because ultimately you never know who's behind those brands. And whilst we had a, a, a vision and a fantasy, and it's all a fantasy when you first start, um, to work with incredible brands, um, we're lucky we do now. We work with incredible logos and incredible brands, but ultimately it comes down to those those shared ambitions with the clients, with the people um, that are giving you those projects. Um, so seeking out those people that saw the world like us was was critical. Love this. And, and, and I love to hear that PR works, that putting content out there about your mission and what you're trying to achieve actually attracts the right people. And again, that obviously you need to make sure that you 
put the right message out that you're very clear on what you're trying to do and why you're doing what you do. So that's the only premise how you attract the right clients for yourself. But it's great to hear that there, there was an organic connection and some, I suppose, serendipity in the finding the first client. During that f- first few years, as you mentioned, it has been worrying and scary. Were there any other things that you were doing to generate overall, like, some sort of awareness that you exist because the few years when you only start obviously you don't have a track record yet you mm-hmm. have personal kind of achievements but as a company no one knows about you and I have to say there's something that is I find I don't know if it was on purpose and you tell me what's the story behind it obviously you don't have portfolio on your website which is a very controversial thing to do for a creative agency throughout the years because we've been following you since since the beginning and I remember having this conversation with people it was like yeah Uncommon is a really interesting agency but you can never find their work and uh, and kind of that created a certain mystery around it so I don't know was it intentional in kind of generating this mysterious buzz around who you are uh, tell us more about how did you generate the buzz <laughs> and what was the thinking behind no portfolio on a website well just to answer the uh the website question it was very intentional um because if your portfolio is not out there then people have to come and talk to you obviously that was always a risk but um far better that people were intrigued and and very often they filled in the gaps themselves and helped us to see what else we could be so we've never wanted to be just an advertising agency hence our name being a studio we do a design project and and then people would come to us and say well, you know, you must be this sort of design company because I've seen this project. And we were like, yeah, we, yeah, we are. <laughs> um, and so I think, I think that allowed our story to evolve naturally with the work that was being put out there. But um, yeah, it was quite intentional on the website. Look, we, we've always taken PR incredibly seriously for us and for our clients. It's a shame. There are very few brands in advertising and we've obviously seen a huge Uh, amount of uh, mergers um, going on in the industry at the moment. So a lot of those long-held, long-established brands have disappeared um, that maybe we we were familiar with. But um, but we were very aware that that actually our biggest calling card would be able to being able to make ourselves famous um, and uh, and to show to clients that we we do have our own social following. Um, We've just done something bonkers called Rat Boots which was just purely for our fun in um in the states in our in our launch over there and it's had 127 million views which was more than the super bowl um so which was just purely a little project that the team in the new york office wanted to do something for themselves um and it was a bit of fun but it's um it's those sorts of things where i think we do really want to make sure that we are showing up in interesting places having interesting conversations um, and and using our opportunities to have a, a point of view on the world to, to really start spark those opportunities for talent to get in touch or clients to get in touch. Love it. And, and I love that uh, kind of strategic decision so you're not put in any box. So if you don't show a portfolio, then you can't be seen as only one type of company, which is a, is a challenge for a lot of uh, successful branding agencies or any agencies when you've done... Um, so many successful projects in one industry, in one area or certain type, people start seeing you as this certain type of company. So you get more of that business, which is great, but then people don't see that you can do other things. So by not showing anything, you kind of keep it very open and then everyone can imagine what can you do and kind of imagine and dream about the projects you can do together. It's very smart, I suppose, very risky and very provocative, and but um, clearly worked out. So uh, that that's very interesting to hear. And you already mentioned your New York office. So let's talk about expansion. So at which point you realized that London is not enough time to expand globally? And what was the catalyst to that? We actually had been working with a lot of American brands um, right from 2020, right from 2020, actually. I lose track of the years in in COVID time, unfortunately. But um, we had already been working with a lot of American brands. And in 2022, actually 50% of our work, even though we were based purely just in in London at the time, was international. We actually won quite a lot of American-based clients from the UK. And I think some of that was because we were tending to to have a different perspective. It was always global from the start. We were very intentional around that. Um, We have lots of uncommon minds around the world who offer perspectives 
in local markets. So we were able to take on global assignments right from the start, <clears throat> but we were particularly finding um, ourselves in, in more and more American conversation. And I think at a certain point, whilst we were um, helping Pinterest redefine itself, we've just had some work go live for Quaker, um, but we've been working with, that, with them for, for over 18 months. We found we needed to have a team in the States. And that wasn't purely because the time zones become tricky to navigate. It, it was also because we just wanted to not be scratching the surface. We felt like there was so much more we could be doing if we had a team there, but also some different talent. And I think the opportunity to to start Uncommon with an American flavour, and it's very deliberately not the London office implanted into America. We are starting there with an American team, which is harder than just taking our team from London and putting them over there. But we really do want that to, to feel like it's uh, an American version of, of Uncommon. So some similar principles about choosing who we make famous and treating our talent with respect and um, recognising our place in the world, baking fame into everything that we do. It's a chance to almost start again um, over in the States. Very interesting choice of locations. And I assume that was the kind of the similar logical following where the clients are. But I would love to talk a little bit more on a practical side, because I think this is a big ambition of any creative agency uh, to kind of go to the new market. And London, New York, I suppose, two obvious choices that people, maybe LA as well, is where people usually think it was like, this would be good to have our HQs. There is plenty of business. And sometimes you do have already some sort of seeds of clients there. But there are obviously risks and costs uh, involved in any sort of expansions like that. So what how did you go about it and what was um did you send just one person first to see how it feels did you get like big office for 100 people and kind of what was the what was the strategy behind the expansion and how did you check in throughout these strategies like okay we can kind of grow a little bit further a little bit further totally honest i think most important was finding our creative lead which we have found and, and sam shepherd is very much on the bus over there and building a, a team, a founding team around around him and uh, and and that crew. So we're still in the midst of, of building it at the moment, but it is very much finding the right team and, and building it um, slowly but surely. We haven't got a, a massive office. We've got a, a small and mighty one, um, but it's important to have a, a home and a space that people can rock up to and get a sense of team um, as quickly as possible, particularly in New York, which has been slower to come back after after the pandemic and, and more hybrid working. Most of it, to be honest, is is rocking up in the right places and trying to have conversations with exciting clients um, who see the world like we do um, and and taking it from there. I'd like to say there's more of a plan. There, there, there absolutely is in terms of, of growing, but I think it, it's going to be determined by how the market receives um, our positioning. Um, and so far, so good. That's great that you mentioned about kind of finding the right people and finding the creative lead that uh, kind of will be the, the core of this operation. We had Steve Bell, the founder of Iris, previously on this podcast, who talked about kind of similar strategy when they, they send someone to their new office. So basically someone from the team who was brilliant and wonderful and who was up for a challenge. So they send them to, to open a new office in a new location and the kind of that became a little kind of seed that then grew into um, the, the the big expansion. Considering UK and US are very different markets, and in general, Europe and US are very different markets. And I, I've heard many stories of how people make assumption that it's very similar because it's the same language, uh, but mm -hmm. the culture and like everything, to be honest, is very different. What were the things that you had to change in the way you work or... I don't know, anything within kind of your team or the company when you open the US office? I think exactly as you've already said, it, not being lulled into a full sense of security that it's the same because it's the same language. I think recognising, particularly given the sort of work that we do, there are very different cultural conversations that we can play into. And there are some that would be appropriate in the UK, which would absolutely not be appropriate 
in the states or need to be handled differently or with different sensitivities and so recognizing that the way that we go about trying to create fame around a conversation and create heat and energy that actually uh, allows a company to you know have a have conversation beyond um, the business that they're in we just need to look at that in a slightly different way um, and so being culturally embedded is, is super key hence it being a, a very american team over there um, and there's lots of our team going back and forth and and chatting and uh, and regularly um, making sure that we're all in it together and supporting them to be given a kind of boost of rockets if you like from the start um but um but yeah it's i think that's been the the biggest change really um that's an aside from the fact that it's just so much more expensive over there um than london that is so true and i think yeah when when people compare anything from salaries to 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 house prices i think yeah uk and us are as far as it can can get so it's quite interesting to to hear obviously when from the running running a business perspective that obviously becomes a massive challenge so when you say kind of changing the conversations and and your approach to fame was was there a change in how you approached finding clients as well what types of clients you were going after compared to european markets so what was um i suppose what was the strategies there like meeting the right people and were there like any particular sector or particular approach that you kind of established to find this first client in the US? It's been, it's still very early days. So we've been open um, officially for, for six months. And, and as I said, we already had the Nike Jordan, Pinterest, Quaker, a, no, a number of different clients over, over in the US already. So it felt less like um, second album syndrome where you're like, oh goodness, how are we going to get this started? We, we were lucky enough to already have those, those clients and those relationships. Um, and I think having that work um, meant that unlike when we first started, we already had the case studies that showed that we understood the local nuances of, of the market. And I think even the clients we were meeting had recognized and knew some of our work already. So it wasn't, it was pushing on a slightly more open door. And the, the market does work slightly differently when it comes to intermediaries than it does in, say, a smaller market like london or the uk yes there are some nuances that we're obviously exploring but so far so good we've we've um been doing some brilliant work with with sirius xm which we're delighted about and uh that's both in branding and brand transformation as well as intercoms uh, yeah our best relationships typically go far further upstream than pure advertising so some of those relationships are already cooking in the background. I'm looking forward to checking in five years and, and hear about your big expansion and how uh, now you have offices across the whole of the US, or maybe you have a, an incredible uh, place in New York. So I'm sure that that expansion will be an incredible success. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the growth overall of your agency. We had lots of people asking about kind of how do you grow beyond this 20, 30 people stage uh, because that seems to be a ceiling for a lot of creative agencies when you do have enough clients and it is going well and you're profitable as a company, but you kind of stay stagnant for a few years and you kind of not even sure which way to grow. Is it new disciplines that you need to kind of add to your portfolio? Is it, again, international expansion that you go for? So how did you find your own journey through that 20, 30 mark and how did you grow beyond that? It's really tricky because uh, we were chatting just before we, we came on here, but I think that that is a, a real jump. And it is a jump because um, when you're growing, change is a constant, obviously, for, for all the team. But you definitely see a shift in the team that you you need at that point, because at a certain point, you've got probably one person in all, in all the core disciplines. If you're not careful, and I certainly have made a few mistakes in this in the past, you end up with some people whose whole job is to manage the team. And and that in itself can can feel a little bit baggy, for want of a better phrase. And so I think ultimately uh, to, to push through that 20, 30 to 70 mark, we just try to project a bigger shadow as if we were already at the 70 mark. So we, tr we hired the managers who had the black book before we had the team. So we, we'd hire a studio manager, a, a resource manager who, who was going to be responsible for all of the creative, all of the design talent that we would be working with. And to start with, 
that was purely freelance designers and and now it's far more of a, a mix um and we work really well with freelance we see them as part of the part of the crew um and treat them in a in a very similar way but obviously just a far more flexible model but we hired those people that would allow us to have stability as we grew and i know that's not necessarily the question you're asking because that's assuming the growth is coming so that's that's a, that's assuming that things won't fall over as you grow um having those people that would give us that stability but it is part of the answer because i think having some of that stability means that you can go to clients with the reassurance that you're not going to fall over and i think that's the concern that some clients often have at that point is oh but we are we a bit big for you and i don't think we ever had that conversation with anyone because we our ideas were of, were of a certain level of ambition um and i think often you know the best way to change your fortunes is is new business sadly um i know no one will want to hear that but the, that is absolutely how it works um and so have a fantasy for the type of company you want to work with and stalk them or or, or find a way to, <laughs> to make them yours but that ambition we had for for those for those brands was so big that we we almost needed to build the team behind the scenes to make sure that we weren't going to fall over if we did manage to to win those clients and off the back of of that 30 to 70 growth we we won B&Q started working with wonderful partners being here that we've been working with ever since two other retailers at exactly the same time having thought that a small company of 30 wasn't able to work with retail it, it was quite a jump these clients so have you for example if we take being as an example have you pitched for them before and you haven't won because you didn't have that structure or is it just serendipitous when you created the structure sometimes somehow the right pitches landed for you it's the it's the latter. I think there is an element of of luck, but I but I do think at a certain point you then believe your own hype a little bit, and obviously you have to be careful. You don't believe that too much, but I think in having those people in place, you knew you were ready. At a certain point, you've got to believe that you can you can push through and and get them. But I appreciate that that can seem quite naive in a in a market that is a little bit uncertain right now, um, and and that it is. It is a tricky time. There's not necessarily always the new business um, leads out there in the same way. And at that point, um, to help us diversify, we haven't just diversified geographically. We obviously are known as a design studio as much as we're known for our work in advertising. We now do feature films as well. And we have other capabilities that, that like CX and CRM that uh, we've absolutely added into the mix to make sure that we are continually able to answer the different questions a client might require. This is brilliant. And I love that you mentioned kind of different capabilities and they're very different from films to CRMs. My question would be, how did you decide which ones to actually follow versus which ones to say no to? Because that's another danger when you try to grow and you just want to take everything that is kind of going away and then you realize you don't even know what, what you are as an agency anymore what kind of projects you do so mm -hmm. how did you select which ones you should grow into which areas are viable for you versus which ones maybe not for now it's a really good question because we absolutely don't and um, wouldn't want to do everything and I think um you've got to be clear about why you're doing it to your point um we've been very very clear that we do want to build we, we love brands and we we absolutely you know, love brands as much as we do love advertising. Absolutely love that too. But it, but our start point is brand, and so design was a natural bedfellow to that. It was it was hard to, for us to use the strategic tools that we built um, that help us define a brand, which is what we use with with our accelerator program, um, and not have a design capability. And my co-founder Nils is an incredible designer he's a designer by background and so that was a natural thing that we we were going to go into anyway and from there it naturally grew and before you know it you have case studies and you start smaller sprat to catch a macro as they say and so we we grew that one out organically um but it came from a real core of of our need and then from there um i'll be honest i think the the reality is we are a studio, so we we do attract a lot of people who are makers who may have left the industry um, and got frustrated and by that I mean the advertising industry they may have left and got frustrated and didn't feel like there was a place for their craft or their skill set and we became 
and have and still are um, a bit of a like a moth to a, to a light, I guess, for some of those people who've otherwise been frustrated. And so we do find ourselves having some wonderful conversations with people who have ideas about how they can um, bring their capabilities to to bear for brands, and they haven't necessarily found that home in the industry. Um, so whether that's you know experiential, whether it's which we've done quite a lot in, um, whether it's feature films, whether it's um, you know, branded entertainment, we've attracted quite a lot of talent. And honestly, if you have someone who's incredible, who's an incredible talent, and they've got energy for it, and you can see it as a natural adjacency to your company, well, then you know, grow a startup inside your company, um, because if they're if they're brilliant and they're capable, and it's not just a hobby then it can become its own revenue stream. And I and I think if you can, as a founder, if you can give talent the space to be able to, to build those things within your company, um, it's, it's really something to watch um, and it really pays you back. So am I right to say that you were basically following what, again, the talent and the people rather than the client? So people joining with different skill sets and wanting to do different types of projects and they're kind of, helped you to offer these types of services to the clients they already have or any potential clients um, and kind of expand basically you expanded from within rather than from the outside it's a bit of both right so for example we knew that if we were going to work with an exceptional client like British Airways who we'd had a massive crush on for, for many years but didn't think for a moment that they might call us but now they're obviously our, our wonderful partners but we knew we'd need CX and CRM and we knew that that was a core cool part and it, and actually that we could have an uncommon version of our view on CX and CRM. Um, and so that's we did set up that capability knowing that to be able to take on a certain type of problem. And we always talk about the Daniel Eck quote, which is the value of a company is the sum of the problems it solves. And so we love to start in that position, which is what's the biggest brief and the most interesting brief that we could um, we could be involved in answering. And so what are the capabilities that we might need to be able to to answer that problem? Um, and so certainly when we, stared, we we were staring at some of those bigger briefs, we realised we needed CX and CRM to be to be part of the mix. But, but yes, some of it is done talent up rather than client need down. Love it. And, and it's also interesting to hear um, that, again, is echoing our previous conversation. It's very interesting how your company and Iris are very two very different studios and agencies, but had so many interesting principles in common that I haven't heard anywhere else um, around these building capabilities around like CRMs and, and kind of understanding the business side, which is not, I would say, the most common areas that creative agencies go to because they're not seen as, I don't know, the most fun and and cool and things that you would kind of show in your game portfolio on your website because they they need to be a great experience there, there needs to be a lot of thinking not necessarily kind of the big wow effect of, of the visual design i i have a feeling a lot of agencies do not take those projects on because maybe it's not something they personally feel passionate about but you are so right to actually work with big clients you do need to work on this larger and kind of more difficult problems that you can solve for them so that way you can provide a better value and therefore you will again grow naturally so that's actually personal insight for me that maybe that what stops people from growing is is internal resistance to take problems that don't look like the coolest and the fun ones to actually solve for a branding or creative agency I mean the biggest problems in the world writ large as well as as well as business problems right so I so I I think for us, that's just it's quite an audacious goal, um, but it's it's definitely definitely gives us fire in our belly about the sorts of you know to recognise the power of creativity to solve some of those problems, and also for the team here to to realise that they it is in their gift, and they are the sorts of briefs we're trying to hunt down. And and just just quickly on the CX CRM thing, I think there's a very uncommon we've we've got a very different stream of how we approach that which is about those moments of of impact which isn't necessarily about smoothing out the customer journey and experience it's about allowing that brand to behave and and those brand behaviors to play out through the customer journey which for us is a natural bedfellow rather than possibly um something to be allergic to but it's a natural bedfellow with 
you know, repositioning the British Airways brand, obviously you're going to think about what's that moment I sit down on the flight? What's what's on the menu? And how do I react when I book a British Airways holiday? So I think those moments of, of surprise and delight and uh, and making sure that um, that the customer feels like the the brand and comms naturally marry up with the experience in quite literal terms is 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 key and can, can be quite exciting. Those briefs can be quite creative. Oh, I 100% agree. I feel like creativity can solve so many of really difficult problems that uh, definitely it's, uh, I can imagine it has been a, an exciting project to, to work on. So let's talk about this growth beyond 70. So you kind of grew from this 20, 30 to 70 by creating the structure, by expanding kind of the pitches. So how did you go beyond that? Was there a point when you like, again, okay, we are 70 now, we need to do something else. So it kind of slowly progressed into the, the bigger scale. So what happened after the 70 mark? Well, COVID hit, which was fun. So yeah, we 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 started when Brexit uh, was announced, and uh, and we've <laughs> and then we've had COVID in the middle. Look, it's best laid plans and everything. It's 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 been like this all the way through. But but each year we have continued to grow, and we I think we've just done that through, as I said, continuing to be ambitious about the sorts of clients that we can partner and how we can be helpful. I'd like to say that it's it's more designed than that. But yeah, we're 220 now. We're in Stockholm, New York, um, Denmark and uh, and London. Um, and, and we've got these different capabilities. So I don't think there's a difference. It does become different after, after 100. And I think the main reason for that is culture. And the main thing that I've seen a number of companies struggle with at that level um, is that you you can't hope to everyone, and if you add in hybrid working into that mix, that becomes tricky. And I think the other thing as a as a founder is that it it is no longer appropriate, even when you get to say thirty people, for the most junior person to be working into the most senior person. That can be very exposing. I think it, certainly when you get to the seventy upwards level, my role is is very much picking a hill, as I call it, which is there are many people now in the team who are exceptional and I couldn't and wouldn't want to do it without them but they're spending time thinking about the business and about the problems and their and their clients businesses my role at that point is more of a support function it's it's setting the clarity to make sure that with constant growth there isn't that uncertainty for them it's about them coming to me with the decisions that it's either 49 percent this way or 40 and 51 percent that way they're not entirely sure how to make that call and that and that's hopefully where I can help them have confidence and move continue to move at speed because above 70 into the hundreds and 200 certainly now you you have to be careful that you don't slow down which sounds a weird thing to say but um we're certainly not doing that if anything we're speeding up but <laughs> but I think you have you have having worked at lots of download companies before that's the moment you really have to keep in check I love what you talk about, like in terms of how your role changed throughout this journey, because I feel like as, as a founder, it's so difficult to let go of what you used to do and what you used to feel and what the company used to be um, and kind of to make sure that this growth actually happens. So what I suppose can you tell a little bit more of, of that journey throughout? I suppose, what did you have to let go or what were your role was when the company was at that kind of 20 30 um, people because you also have two other co-founders so I assume you split your responsibilities accordingly so what was your role at this 20 30 stage versus 70 stage versus over 100 it's changed in that there's a there's a lot more people management there's always been people management even when there was three of us and I think the biggest mistake to make at any point is thinking that that's peripheral um because as we said you know talent is everything um not just in people that are writing the scripts it is absolutely your biggest strength or your big, biggest weakness and it can it can be a huge distraction if you get it wrong so i think my role um over time has, has definitely become far more actively um people management whereas i guess at the start it was a lot more operational but now in starting out in new york or or sweden it's it's back to being operational in certain places again as well so it's a bit a bit of both it's changed over time but but yeah now obviously certainly when you get to 70 people everyone wants to believe 
um, and know that the that what they're delivering, what they're bringing to the to the company, that the sum is bigger than the parts and the part that they're playing. And so I think you can never under communicate. You you have to keep talking, you have to keep explaining and keep drawing lines between what someone's doing over here and someone's doing over there. And that's regardless of geography. I think you can do that with 30 people sat around one table going out for, you know, a, a meal together or you can you can do it in smaller ways. But as we've got bigger, you have to actively drive that into the working day because everyone's always going to be too busy to, to do that. But I think over time you really miss that if, if someone isn't driving that and that's that's on, on me. So how do you do this? Like, what what does your week look like? Do you have, I don't know, Monday morning meeting with the entire team, daily catch up with senior members? Like, what, what does this look like, this kind of overall um, view of uh, where you need to be? So we have a company meeting every every month. I do a new joiner breakfast for every single new joiner, um, often a group of five to eight people every every month. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, and uh, and then yes, I have lots of operational meetings, one to ones, mini groups, working with the, the the people who are running the businesses day to day for CX or America or um, or London, and uh, and so making sure that I'm able to guide from the sides um, and that I'm available, and I think that's the it's very easy to become very busy and we've all and we're all very busy but um it's too easy to to forget that actually you need to be accessible and i mean that more in more than just a, a smile it, your diary can't be so full um that they that they can't have access so i, I regularly put in regular catch ups and then they're in the diary and i try not to remove them and is it catch ups with uh kind of middle management kind of the most senior people uh, the other co-founders how do you split between different levels of people that you need to catch up with it's tricky because i think uh, any more than i think it's eight is the number that most people say to me that any more than eight reporting direct reports is is too much for someone to manage um i probably have 10 at the moment it's always good to keep that in check any more than 10 direct i think you do really struggle to to see them once a week and that could be problematic if if they all had something screamingly urgent they need to discuss with you and that's aside from the fact that we all obviously should be speaking to our clients and i think my my role hasn't changed over time it's still incredibly important that i understand our clients needs that i'm there for them and unavailable if anything gets more important as as you get bigger thank you so much for sharing and we will be taking questions from all of you wonderful people in this conversation right now so start preparing your questions and putting them in the chat we will start answering them in a bit i mean in the meantime i want to ask a few questions that have been pre-submitted and lots of interesting ones so a lot to dive in what is the most common mistakes uh, for a small scale one to three person startup agency to make in their first years and how to avoid them? Sebastian is asking. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> I think um, the most important thing to stare at, it's boring, but is, is revenue and resource. I would be the first to say you've got to back yourself and make those key hires that are going to help you um, win that new new client but I think and I'm just seeing some of the other questions come through doing that with caution so if you are able to ha be honest about the talent you might be bringing on board and do it either on a temp to perm basis or a freelance basis then obviously that that helps with everyone but I think keeping the revenue and the resource in check it and those numbers in check is 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 critical partly because otherwise you'll make the wrong calls in terms of um, saying yes to pieces of business because you need to support the headcount. And we said no more than we said yes when we first started. And that was terrifying. <laughs> but it was, uh, I think, so important for making sure that Uncommon felt different from the start. I don't know if that answered Sebastian's question, but I hope it did. <laughs> that was really great answer. Thank you so much. We'll answer a few more while um, more questions are piling up in the chat. Um, so we have um, a question. How do you control quality and production during growth in a joint venture? Tala is asking. 
So I suppose when you work with startups, especially. Oh, okay. We we don't do a great deal of production with our startups that go through unrest because they're at such an early stage um, in terms of quality control. Did you say so? Yeah. I mean, I think when we've done work with with sex brand because we're a studio and therefore production uh, capable ourselves, we are a production company ourselves. We've done a lot of that ourselves, and so. The best part there is just to essentially work like a skunk works and the client sits inside our office um, and uh, and we've got the makers team literally behind me through that door. And so from a quality control point of view, it still has the seniority, but we have young makers who are here and, and we can, you know, the, the, the chance for risk is far more, more small. Love it. Thank you so much. And slightly connected to, to this one, uh... A very painful question from Matt. How do you manage client side delays that push projects back month on end? In particular, how do you fill that gap and keep things running? Oh, goodness. I uh, wish I had an answer to this one, Matt. It is really tricky. It's a risk every month. I mean, we're a very project-based, uh, project-led company as much as we are. We have quite a few retainers and that's great. Um, but I think, again, it's back to that revenue resource question right from Sebastian at the start. I try and keep a, a, an eye on exactly what revenue resource we have each month. Um, and when client when projects go back, you know, unfortunately, very often that hits the bottom line because that revenue is not coming in. So the question there is, if you do have a more flexible team, is there a way to, to stomach that by carrying it over? Or can you, if it's a longer delay, can you park them and then bring them back? And, and uh, I think that's obviously bit of a nuanced answer but it's um it is very common um and i think the the only way to answer it really is beyond managing it your side is to be having as candid conversations with clients as possible at all times and sharing that problem with them letting them know that delays will will affect your bottom line therefore your ability to deliver and if they're good partners they should understand that they can't always change it but they may help you lessen the pain with transparency and honesty it's a great way to deal with any challenge Mm -hmm. marty is asking when growing the creative team initially how do you balance hiring new full-time employees versus relying on contract designers i from the start i've always seen freelance and perm uh, as a emotional decision as much as anything because some designers some editors would much prefer to be out there in the world working on the projects they select and I totally respect that and then coming to us for the things that they want to work on so I always want to make sure that we're first dibs um, and uh, and that those people want to come to work with us so they they do hopefully feel like part of the family we have what I call a lot of repeat offenders that, that come back regularly but um but when they aren't working on a project with us they're off doing amazing things out there in the world yeah I, I embrace them um probably more than more than HMRC would allow me to but I do I do embrace them uh, as part of the team so for me it's a mix and we uh, don't treat freelance like a sticky plaster it's not used as goodness we aren't cracking this one who do we bring in and get to work through the night on it um, which I think has definitely been my previous experience of how freelance may have been used in the past Um, so we we use it as a more flexible model Um, so we do actually plan for bringing freelance in. This is very interesting that you mentioned that, especially kind of more philosophical part of how you approach freelancers and contractors, because I do feel it very much aligns with how the new generations of creatives feels like they're not looking for a full time positions and jobs. And actually, that scares them to work for a company and (laughs) for especially for a long time that would rather work on a project and kind of go away and or maybe work for a year and then do something else and then come back. So having that flexible structure that you already seems like you have built in that allows people to go in and out but you still have this pool and network of people that you love collaborating with you know they're great collaborators you already have kind of uh, they have reputation within your company I think this is a very smart and very future focused way to think about how to grow a creative company so thank you for sharing this Stephanie is asking how did you find at the start when you needed money the most and I know this is quite unusual, but we did actually take some investment right at the start from um, 
strategic investment people, so angels, who knew the industry. Not all of them did, but they knew the industry and they were very, very supportive. They were um, supportive, but not. Um, they didn't feel like they needed to get involved lots, which was which was great. To be honest, we, in hindsight, we probably didn't need the money, um, but we did need the money in order to make sure that we, did, we made the right decision. So back to that thing I, I mentioned earlier, it gave us the power to say no. It also, back to my answer to the earlier question, it allowed us to hire um, some pretty senior people quite early on who helped us project a bigger shadow to seem bigger um, and to get to answers quicker, um, which meant that in turn we seemed bigger and we and we went in with a certain calibre of work. So that, we took that on right at the start and uh, I, I did that off the back of spending quite a lot of time with um, accelerators and investment funds when I was in my delay between leaving Grey and starting on Coleman. Um, and then more recently, we've done a deal with Havas Vendi, uh, which has allowed us to go into the States and uh, to go on our big growth spurt that we're now doing. And, and again, with the same certainty, but also some brilliant partners that, that understand that we want to continue to be entrepreneurial. That is very good to hear. And I... It's very interesting that you how you reflect on kind of getting this investment in the beginning because I think that's a very scary decision to make when you don't know how far you will grow and how much of a stake you will give. Was it a big stake that you were giving at that point to these investors or no, it was a, it was definitely a minority stake. It definitely laid down a gauntlet for how how we wanted to grow. They were amazing and showed a lot of lot of face because <clears throat> obviously in a talent-based industry it's um it, it is not really a a known thing it doesn't usually happen so I think we were very lucky from that point of view um to get their backing but but it definitely allowed I mean it didn't need to be as sizable as it was it could have been smaller I think even having friends and family I mean, it just some money that allows you to feel like you don't have to say yes to whatever first walks in the door and we did turn down some really well-known brands that we just felt we again we principally didn't feel like we wanted to help make them famous and that we were also yeah we we found ourselves coming up with the wrong answers it wasn't going to be the famous work that we wanted to be known for and everything you do at that stage is something else you don't do and so it's so important that you're really selective about the sorts of clients that you choose to work with because you know that founding team are so critical um, in in being focused on the right stuff, not everything needs to be done, and yeah, being distracted with clients you don't need. While, while you already mentioned it, Rob was actually asking: Are there any particular clients you choose not to work with? And um, I suppose is there any particular like logic? How do you select when you say this is not the right client? They don't align with our vision. Are there particular criteria do you look at? And Rob is also asking: Is this part of your future growth plans for expanding into new sectors, such as charity sector, for example? Yeah, we, we do have, I mean, everyone always talks about the holy trinity of do they come with money? Are you going to have fun or learn something from them? And uh, are they going to do great work? But I guess ours is slightly different. And we, we look at, do they want to be famous? And it's interesting because not every client does. So some want to maybe keep their head below the parapet. And that's that's absolutely fine. But that's not the sort of work that, that we do. Can we help them be famous? Are you, do they have something that that? Um, we think is is interesting and that will um, allow them to to kind of break through in a category or do something different and should they be and they're the kind of few things that we look at and and I think that um, question about whether someone principally should or shouldn't be famous we we have some hard lines we won't work with betting companies or vape companies uh, and so those those are hard lines that we personally have drawn and then the rest of the time it's a debate and conversation with our with our team because um, as I said at the start I think we we're very much wanting to make sure that we're helping those companies find their place in the world um, and sometimes far better for us to be in there in the boardroom helping them work out their place and to become better companies um, than uh, than not. I, I love this question about from Alex. To maintain a 200-person structure, do you work with retainers and yearly contracts or do you primarily handle one-off project briefs? 
both. <laughs> I can answer that one quite quickly. Yeah, we do work with retainers, but um, but we don't only look for retainers. Um, we do um, work with a lot of clients on a project base uh, basis. Um, we're firm believers that if we start working with a client on a project base, we we treat every brand like it's our own. And so we're going to throw ourselves fully in and that hopefully that will um, result in incredible, effective work um, that then means that they come back for project two. And so we have a lot of clients like that who are yeah on permanently coming back for projects. Different with the design, as I'm sure everyone appreciates, those design projects tend to be in and out, but um, but very often we'll then be doing something else for them as well. Thank you. I have a question from Tyvon. Uh, when it came to PR and building a name for yourself in the space, especially at inception, did you use a pre-existing model strategy or was it organic and based on trial and error? And error? It was mainly based on intuition. I think I'd say um, we we obviously know what the corner, co- cornerstones are of building a brand. We make a lot of our clients famous, um, so there are definitely places that um, and and mechanisms and levers that we absolutely use, and you can mechanize things for fame. And we're we're big believers in that. You know, none of our client work is left to chance as to how it is. PR or how it becomes famous so we use the same levers on ourselves you know some of that is uncomfortable with someone like myself putting yourself out there regularly but I think no knowing that actually it's important to be in the conversation and uh, and having those debates and for people to get to know you um is is critical so that's that's a large part of our of our PR plan and lots of people voting for another question from Alex. How would you define a creative studio model as opposed to an advertising agency model or a design studio model? Do the talents in your team work on both design and advertising briefs? Yes, they do work on both briefs. Uh, strategy team in particular um, work on design, advertising, experiential briefs, um, CRM briefs. Our, our studio model essentially is um, a bit like Avengers Assemble, I guess, a Hollywood model, um, where we are far less like the more traditional advertising model where things tend to go through the process. You write a strategy, you then do creative development, then it goes into production, then you chuck it over the fence for someone else to probably make for you, and then you get it, it done. And I, I, that sounds a bit uh, pedestrian, I know that's, that's probably being a bit simplistic, but ultimately we have a lot of makers in our team. Um, we have a lot of craft skills. And so we get to the answer quicker by um, bringing design thinking and production thinking into the room uh, right up front. And we also do create creative and strategy at the same time, which I know for many people who've been in the industry a long time, was seen to be completely anathema because that's the expensive bit. And surely you wait until you've definitely got your strategy sorted. But it doesn't mean to say we're wasteful, but we are. We definitely do those things far more hand in glove, far more round the table and in the round. And we do bring makers, and in us I mean design, far earlier up into the process. And I think it it tends to take, help paint a picture for clients a lot earlier. Also, means that you're far more you're far quicker to the answer or to what the answer isn't um, and help clarify that with clients so we're just far less dependent on trying to find someone else to make it for us and the studio model also allows us to bring in expert talent from outside and partner with them whether that's for a um, an experiential thing we may not have done before and and bring that talent into the team and create co-productions with them. Brilliant. Thank you for clarifying. I was actually wondering about this myself because I, I feel like in the modern, I suppose, language that new studios use, that definition between agency versus studio versus, I don't know, like anything else is a bit lost. So I suppose mm-hmm. from the original, the initiation, the agency is where you just, you don't do much in-house. You just represent lots of people in service and you collaborate with people versus the studio where you have everything in-house and you can provide and build and kind of do things um, within the studio and provide them to other clients. I actually don't know if if people still differentiate it that way that much in the industry or it kind of it all, it all merged and everyone is a little bit of everything nowadays. <laughs> Um, great. We have another question that has been very popular from Marex. I contacted many companies offering my graphic design services, but all of my clients are word of mouth clients. How do you actually get new clients without recommendations? What did you do before you grew to 200 people? 
look, we have a lot of word of mouth. We also have a lot of clients who have been exceptional at helping us build those case studies when they're on their PR tours of whatever they're doing, talking about how their success of their company, they've been kind enough to to use that as a chance to talk about our case study. There is an awful lot of that that goes on. We've had lots of recommendations from clients uh, who've recommended us. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but we, we do rely on quite a lot of word of mouth and, and advocacy as part of our, our model even now. I suppose I would follow up with this question in terms of when you don't have, it's good when you have projects. So people, again, from, from, from the projects that you already did come more projects, but when you still don't have enough of, I suppose, the base or the network, how do you go about apart from, do you just knock on people's doors and say, Hey, I can do great oh. work. And this is what I can do for you. No, we, I mean, I think that's where something like Rat Boots comes in and some of the, the projects that are even behind me, um, some of them are things we've developed ourselves. So that's also the studio model, which is we're not dependent on people coming to us with commission briefs, i.e. brands who have a, a task they need us to do. We can create it ourselves. Um, and so I, I'd suggest if, if, you know, if you are doing graphic design, there, there will be either it could be pro bono, it could be working with charities, it could just be something you think deserves to exist out there and something you see that you would like to apply your services to or an initiative um, that you, you think you want to put out there or just something fun. Um, and I think sometimes that can be a, a great calling card. It also keeps you fresh um, and keeps the team energised and that's that's what we've done a lot here. And actually, going back to the rad bit, because it's it's such an interesting project, and we will include the link in, in comments um, to, to that interesting case study. Because I think with that kind of viral content, and that was pretty much, I assume, was meant to be viral, you knew that that what will bring people attention. Sometimes you get the wrong attention as well, because mm -hmm. again, it's it's general public attention. It's not necessarily clients' attention. And so, did you think up front of like? who it will attract and did it attract the right people honestly i think <laughs> um i uh well nils lucy and i when we first founded uncommon didn't want to just be known as a as an advertising or a, a b2b company i'd quite like my my parents my family my friends to to know who we are regardless um outside of the industry so you know i think a lot of people have been very damning about the advertising industry the marketing industry and is it good and i think look, we, we want to be one of those companies that's helping to define a more positive version of what our industry is. But for that, we need to be known by outside of advertising. And advertising gets the bad rap, but actually we can change fortunes, we can change business fortunes, we can change behaviours for more positive um, things in the world. So, you know, ultimately we don't mind if other people hear about us and don't quite know what we do, as long as they're they're getting a chance to to be exposed to some of our work and, and some of it might just be fun um but some of it might actually be uh be, be changing their minds or something brilliant thank you so much kate is asking how important do you see the agency brand in general and also specifically in terms of business development especially given the rise in freelancing and in-house and that seems to be happening currently Look, there's many different models out there, isn't there? And I think in-house has definitely has a place. We work with a lot of uh, our brands, our, our clients' brands that um, that do have in-house teams, and and they're phenomenal. They're great, and they're great partners for us, and uh, and that works really, really well. But I think if you if you are going to have a company, I think it is incredibly important that people know why you get out of bed every day, um, and what they should expect from you versus. Um, someone else otherwise we do unfortunately I think we we end up um, reducing the value of, of what we all bring to the table I mean any any agency any studio is just a collection of amazing talent um, but if you if you play that out then what's the difference between this company and that company company A and company B ultimately it's brand and, and if we can't get that right then I don't know how clients would would trust us with their own um, so yes I think it is increasingly important. Thank you so much. And one last question from Alex. The transition beyond the threshold 20 to 25 employees is often particularly challenging as it requires a significant increase in resources. Do you have an advice for overcoming this hurdle? 
It's a real hurdle, I know, because you do start putting, as I said at the start, um, you do start to take on board people who are seem to be he- headcount, for want of a better word. And, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in fasting um, rather than just trying to put bums on seats that that um, you can then monetize. So I think it is important to think about that whole team, but I, but I recognize that jump means that you start to take on people that are... Um, are maybe not necessarily contributing to the bottom line directly and that's where it gets really tricky but I think the important thing at that point is I I would ask a different question which is if you're at that point there must be certain things that as the leadership that you're doing that uh, are probably not the best use of your skills and if you could be in more pictures if you could be calling that client back quicker if there's more work that or you just had time to think about where else you could go or who you might or your new new business strategy um or just you know going to that extra cocktail event that might mean you meet that client if there are day-to-day things that having that 25th or 26th person might uh, might free you up to be able to focus on the things you're really good at and can be most valuable to the company at then it seems like a, a risk, um, but it's an opportunity cost if you if you don't invest in those people, because I think it often pays back in spades. And while you mentioned actually having the headspace, I think there is one thing that you, you briefly mentioned about kind of having your own resource as, as a founder. I would love to also, I don't know if you have any final advice for, for anyone how to restore this resource as a, as a founder. Um, considering you work a lot and I don't know if rabbits uh, do help to restore the resource but any other things that you found that you as a founder need to obviously look after yourself but what what do you do to make sure that you actually have the energy to run such a huge company you're you're completely right if you haven't got energy for it as a founder then no one else will the energy you carry as well is incredibly important right people really do look to you as to how they should fake news is this positive is it not should we have won that client are we disappointed that it isn't oh am I gonna have a job tomorrow so I think that's is it so important and so it's important not to wear that heavy um yes the rabbits help I'm glad they've got a couple of mentions in this they'll be very happy um but no most importantly for me personally is family um because that that's important. That's life, and uh, and I think it's it's so important not to let that pass you by at the same time. So yes, I do work hard, but I I you know, and I'm looking at emails when I may be with the rabbits, but I do try and work quite smartly to make sure that I find those places for what I know grounds me, so that it isn't all about work because ultimately you won't be your most creative or your most available to your team if um, if you're too stressed out. Thank you so much, Natalie. I have one last question for you that we ask at the end of this podcast to all wonderful people that come on the show, uh, which is a bit philosophical. If you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? <laughs> world peace uh, would be would be my big thing right now. Look, I think it, bringing it closer to home, I, I genuinely believe in the power of creativity to really solve some of the world's biggest problems. And I and I guess climate change being being one that I'm particularly um, so, yes, someone being creative with the brief of let's sort this out once and for all would be uh, that would be my one wish. Well, this is such a lovely answer. And I do believe creativity can change so many things. So um, definitely it's great to have people like you who empower other creatives to to solve problems and change something for the better. So thank you. Thank you for for being who you are. And thank you for running such an incredible company. And thank you for sharing your thinking and inspiring everyone. Uh, who is listening to us with what is possible, what is achievable, and and uh, also hearing your ambition to do even more and inspiration to do where you're growing and what more things you want to do. It's uh, it's incredible. And um, I personally learned a lot from this conversation. So thank you for being um, so honest and 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 so warm and so uh, so lovely. So I really appreciate and I can see that everyone also found uh, this conversation very inspiring. So thanks, everyone, for joining and, and answering and asking so many great questions. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions. Anywhere people should find you, anything they should check out, um, anywhere you should want to send them to to see more of what you do. Well, we have a little bit more on uh, on our website than we did when we first started. It's a bit more than a bouncing flag now. So uh 
there's there's always new news on there and uh, and we're pretty prolific on on instagram and vimeo so yeah check us out so for yeah for anyone that is interested uncommon.studio is the website so check us out and um if uh, you found something interesting during this conversation please share your insights on instagrams and twitters and x's and linkedins of the world and tag future london academy and uncommon studio so we could know what you found inspiring and interesting so we can bring you more inspiring conversations. Thank you again for, for listening and tuning in. Thank you, Natalie. This has been incredible. And um, thanks for everything that you do. And until next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.